Uh, okay, these are old slides. That's what I used to do. So, so what I'm kind of going, going to try and do a really high level quick tour through is three different areas. The first is um, like to try and frame the use cases for event store and service orientation in general. I'm going to blast through that really quickly because this group probably knows that stuff already. Um, and then what I'm going to try and spend most of the time on is the internals of event store. Has anybody played with or used event store in any capacity? Cool. Anyone never seen it before? Okay, cool. I, I will go through and demonstrate how it works and what, and what the use cases are. So, um, go back to 2006, seven kind of time, and you used to hear this thing all the time. So, service oriented architecture, SOA. Um, there's no joke that there must have been a Dutch guy on the committee that named this because, so SOA, you know, in English means service oriented architecture, in Dutch it means sexually transmitted disease. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's quite clear that there was a Dutch guy on the panel that named it. Uh, who was quietly laughing to himself. However, it turned out to be prescient for most of what was produced under the auspices of service-oriented architecture. So I guess it was, it didn't look too badly in the end. Um, so the, if we go back to the architecture that you know, you, you'd commonly see in enterprise applications in the late 90s, I guess, what you'd see is you know, a database, probably you know, an RDBMS, probably Oracle or SQL Server or Sybase or something like that. And then you see a fact client that talked directly to it. So the client would you know, connect to the database, authorize as a user, and then present forms over the data in the database. And that was fine. Um, it was kind of hard to maintain in some cases, didn't scale very well. And the big problem was you know, if people wanted to scale it out so they could have web UIs. So that led to you know, development in this where the client would become like a web app, and then you'd have a service or like a business logic tier that implemented business rules outside of the database that was in like theoretically testable code. And then you'd have the database with less logic in it. So yeah, we're talking here like early 2000s kind of architecture. And then SOA came along and people were like, well, so far we've just added layers, so let's do that again. And we ended up with this extra layer, um, you know, called a services layer, which generally like just proxies straight through to the business logic. But you know, maybe if you were building some kind of API, that's what you'd end up with. And the problem with this is, you know, if we go back to the original aim of, of service orientation as a principle, the aim was to try and increase the alignment between people building systems and the businesses they were trying to support. You have to wonder, like, how does adding an extra layer of indirection to everything do that? And it turns out it didn't. So the problem is service really overloaded work. And like the other problem is it has like an actual English meaning as well, which, you know, like the bartender serves you a bit, which actually has nothing to do with like anything useful to us in software. So it's already overloaded and now it's also meaningless. Um, so one of the best definitions of SOA came from PDC, I think, the Microsoft Professional Developer Conference from a guy called Don Box, who was at Microsoft in, um, oh, Hey, we're out of battery. Uh, so they, that came around in like the late 90s, 96, I think it was. <coughs> and he defined basically four um, axes on which you can measure service-oriented architecture, or at, which you, at least which you can measure. But they were, okay, that's not the problem. Cool, there we go. So this was described as the four tenets of service orientation. And it helps, like actually kind of helps, um, Udi Dahan pointed this out a while back. It was like, if you take away the word service and replace it with the word thing, then like suddenly this makes a lot more sense, right? So what we're trying to do is build things which are autonomous. So we want software to be able to fail um, without causing activating failure. We want the boundaries of the thing to be explicit. Um, we want to share schema rather than sharing um, you know, physical code between different services. And we rather they were controlled by policy. So if we go break these down for a second and compare them to like the average you know, WCF, has anybody done like WCF or like JNI, sorry, not uh, Java remote and that kind of stuff for building services. Okay, so let's think about these in relation to that kind of technology, like the RPC synchronous kind of thing. So autonomous like kind of depends a little bit but the chances are if you have a WCF service that's acting as like your front door for, a, for an application, um, you can call it 
and it will go and make another like a bunch of calls behind it. And the problem is if like I call A, A calls B, and B is down, and A doesn't work, and it's hard to say that like A is not it's someone else was the thing that should be autonomous down. So we don't really meet autonomous in most um, examples of this kind of like web service architecture. Boundaries are kind of interesting. Like you could say you have explicit boundaries because you know there's a, there's a very explicit client called the service. But then like what happens behind there is kind of boundless. Right? So it's like having like a boundary. Maybe that works, maybe it doesn't. The next two they're actually really good at because enterprise vendors decided like this is what we're going to focus on. So you know, there's all kinds of manners of description language. Um, so actually they kind of meet that fairly well. And in particular, WCF did a really good job abstracting things like policy, so authentication, authorization, that kind of stuff. It's all pulled out into common libraries. That actually works quite well. So I don't want to spend too much time on this, but I'm going to give an alternative definition of service that is really, I think is better to look at when we're talking about service oriented architectures and event sourcing. And I'm going to use that versus microservices because what is really um, so I'm going to use this definition, which is a service is a technical authority for a business capability. So if it's going to be a technical authority, then all of the related information has to be inside this thing. So you don't have like a service which is, um, yeah, if you have a service related to a business capability, it needs to have all of the code and all of the data so that it can be an authority because otherwise if it makes calls to other things and the other thing has to do the work and respond, then yeah, the service isn't the authority. The other thing is the authority that is doing the work and respond. So the word capability is important. Specifically, it's not like activity, entity, workflow, action. They're only bigger. They normally match up with like department names in a business. Or so if you think through services for an insurance company, you're more likely to find things like the actuarial service, the policy, um, policy sales, the claims department, that kind of thing. They all tend to map quite neatly onto services. They don't tend to map onto the unit of technical deployment because it's supposed to be a business concept for aligning things, business concept technical systems. So before we look at what services are, let's look at what they aren't. Um, so in particular, a service that only has functionality and no data is a function, not a service. Um, we can blame Eric a little bit for this because the BDD book uses services in this manner. But when we're talking about service oriented architecture, the word service has to mean something different to that. Um, and that's fine, like software should have functions. Um, it worked on one particularly terrible system, but which was like a 15,000. Um, but it's not a service, right? It's a function. And then a service that only has data and no logic in it is a database. So, not a service. Okay. If you don't create, read, update, delete with some entity or some like data layout, then it's a database. It doesn't matter whether it's like writing to flat files or something else, it's still logically it's a database. So if you go back to the web architecture, what we're really building is functions calling functions, calling functions, calling databases, which is like a three layer, four layer architecture. And that doesn't really help with the writing things. So where's the word microservices come from? Um, Microservice is one of those things which is unfortunately co-opted by far too many people without really knowing. Like, really well. um, and if you go back to the definition presented by, so it was popularized by Adrian Cockroft in Netflix, for sure. Um, his definition was a lot more nuanced than you see today. His definition was um, service-oriented architecture with bounded context. So he was merging the concepts of DDD and service-oriented architecture together. So you often find that the main model specific to a service because it represents the logical um, domain of a, business, of a particular area of a business. And one of the anti-patterns from early on was to have um, you know, one domain that covered the entire business, tried to map everything into the same area. Anyone that's ever worked on an insurance business in the late 90s has probably seen like, you know, like the giant entity relationship diagram generated from the database that covers that entire wall. And like has lines all over it. No one knows. That. You can tell who's worked on an insurance system like that immediately. <laughs> um, so this is an, uh, a diagram um, which distills an old paper by a guy called Philip Krustein, uh, 
uh, my French, sorry. there are probably French people here as well. Sorry, my French is bad. Um, this was like from 95, something like that. It's called the 4 plus 1 architectural view model. And what it effectively states is there are multiple ways that we can look into our software. So we could look at it from the perspective of like, okay, which repository is the code in? Which process is the code physically running in when it's deployed in an environment? Like which, um, like what's the physical layout of these servers? Like is it distributed across data centers? Is it on one box? Is it across cores? Is it, on, you know, is it in a single thing? And then there's a the logical view, which is kind of like the business aspect of it. And you can look at software from any of these directions and get kind of a different map into it. And they're bound together by the use cases of the system. So if you take any particular use case of the system, for example, like you know, pay out this claim, then you should be able to go back and look at any of these views, identify you know, okay, where, if we're gonna use this, if we're gonna make this it happen, okay, where does the code come from? Where is it running? What's the logical architecture of it? What's the physical layout of it in production? And microservices is kind of what you get when you make all of these the same. So you have one repository building code which runs in one process, which runs on one fleet of physical servers. And there's no need for it to be that way. You can do alternative. So we end up with multiple services deployed in the same application. That's, that's a good start. And it affects layering um, so that we end up with layers in a slightly different manner to what we're used to. So rather than being uh, technical descriptions of the type of code in a particular layer, um, what we end up with is vertical slices representing services and then different technical aspects living within a particular service. So we don't have a UI layer of code. We have lots of components of UI, which each logically lives within its own service, depending on what it's related to. So we end up, and then we can start to specialize implementation according to what's actually required to implement that. So we could have, for example, like the UI for, um, you know, UI components for each of these aspects of a system um, living within the service that they're responsible for. And then completely different backend implementations for each of these. So, you know, in some areas we can use SQLite and event sourcing. In some, it might be sufficient to just serve JSON off of this you know, platform, that kind of thing. But do you want to be somewhat interactive or questions of you? Ah, you can interrupt. Well, that's fine. Okay. okay. So, user interface. How do you? I mean, user interface can cross boundary context. Yeah, right? absolutely. Yeah. So, uh, it's, but you still have to have a sort of separate. The components. So, I think it's, it's fairly common to have, hold on, I need to make sure I get this the correct way around. So, the bounded context is about a shared language. And the shared language usually exists within the context of a business capability. Now, sometimes the language is shared across two of them, um, in which case, you know, there's never a cut. This is definitely this. The services are definitely this, this, and this versus sometimes some of them have to be merged together, that kind of thing. So it's kind of it's like a fluid. It's less absolute than I'm really making out of this diagram, and there's absolutely scope. Oh. And on the other hand, you can interface where lots of languages are mixed in the same quote unquote screen. You maybe you have a UX problem. Right. Exactly. Like yeah, generally, a UI yeah, is going to be yeah, specialized yeah. according to the yes. user that should be using it. Um, and you can tell when no one knew what the use cases of the system were because then you have a giant fucking grid. Yeah. <laughs> and that's the only thing, that's the only way. And like the business logic lives in the manual that's printed out next to it. Um, we actually had a, a large consulting company um, explain to us one time, I think it was Greg that they explained it to, um, about why it was preferable to encode all the business logic in the manual instead of in the software, because that wasn't under change control. So, you know, they needed to change the process. They would have to go through like a six month QA cycle on the software. They could just go and print out a new copy of the manual and so people could use it. <laughs> okay, fine, whatever. Um, <laughs> yeah. 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 Exactly. Like, there's a, you know, everything's the back end to something else. And eventually there's some like frontis end, if you like. And with the React and the uh, Redux stuff, which is starting to expand a bit with 
actually having uh, different bound cortex uh, aka components communicating with events in the same way you did with data on the back end. So I actually have a great an example of that then. So if we think about like Amazon from you know this is Amazon Co UK from like six years ago because that's my role is nice. Um, like we can look at the information on this page, and it's you know it's one UI that's logically presented to us, but it's quite clear that like not all of this stuff lives within one service in Amazon. And because of the way Amazon developed, where like Jeff Bezos told everyone they were going to figure out what so it was and do it within a month, otherwise they were fired. Um, like we know they're using SOA. <laughs> Um, but like we can see what like we've got some static stuff here, like some information about the book and the author, like some photographs of it. Um, then over here, there's like uh, Kindle prices for it. There's stock levels. There's you know the, the price that's specialized to my account, um, the delivery schedules. Like there's a bunch of different services here that are all composed at the UI. There. It's not like there's some. Yeah, at some point we have a composition route for this page that's drawing components from like from a whole bunch of other services, composing them together into something that I can go look at as a user. Now this might not be done at the client, it might be done like some, some like you might be running React at the, at the server or something like that, or you know, doing this in a client using WPF or whatever. Whatever implementation you like, the implementation is less important than the concept of data and code being owned by a service from top to bottom, regardless of how it's presented or where. Um, so the corollary of all this stuff is, um, uh, I think, called Conway's Law. People have probably come across. Um, this is a guy called uh, Melvin Conway, who up until three years ago, I had very much confused with John Conway, from, who invented Conway's Game of Life. And when I asked him, I, so we were at a conference, I think Adam was there as well. Um, I, Mel Conway was one of the keynote speakers, and I embarrassed myself thoroughly by asking him about the implementation of Conway's game of life repeatedly before he pointed out to me that that was <laughs> <laughs> Fair enough. He still did some good work. Um, so Conway's law effectively states that you know, organizations build systems with the communication parts that represent the, the structures, the communication structures of the organization itself. Um, it's the best example uh, exemplified by compilers, where if you have four teams working on a compiler, you will get a four pass compiler. Um, but also like by many SOA systems where actually you can be perfectly IT business aligned and if the business is a mess in and of itself, then the system is still. So yeah, this is no like panacea for bad software or bad organizations. Like, sure they should be linked, but yeah, you have to fix the business before you can fix the software. You should, um, that's kind of sad story. In that case, start a competitor. Uh, so I don't want to delve too much more into service orientation. That was just like to frame um, something else, which was the applicability of CQRS and event sourcing, um, which is I'm just going to delve quickly into and then talk about the event store and like jump from business level to like bits on this. Um, so event sourcing and CQRS. Um, often get described as like a nice architecture for things. And the problem is they're not an architecture at all. It's a design pattern that you use within a component of within you know, some kind of larger architecture. It's not an architecture in and of itself. Um, so specifically it goes to the domain model pattern. Um, how many people have like a domain model in their system? Presumably everyone. But how many people like, it's probably less common at this kind of group, but if you go to like a tech ed or something, most people's idea of what a domain model is, is like the objects generated by the ORM from the data. And that's not really a domain model, uh, at least not in a meaningful sense. So the domain model pattern came out of or the, you know, the uh, like canonical definition of it, I guess, comes from Patents and Enterprises Application Architecture, Martin Fowler's book. Um, and I think page 219. <laughs> I actually don't have that written down. It just happened to another page 219. <laughs> uh, they define the domain model pattern. It's one of several patterns in the transaction processing section of the book. And specifically, it's, des it's designated, like, so the format of that book is you have the pattern name, and then you have like a brief description of it, and then you have where it's applicable. And the use cases for a domain model pattern are a direct quote, again, not written down, I just know this one too well. It's where you have complex and ever-changing business rules. 
And then it goes on to say, if all you have is some null checks and sums to calculate, you should probably use something else. So quite often you find that implementations with the main model pattern don't have complex ever-changing business rules. They're more like you know, null checks and sums, and you'd probably use something else. So assuming that we are using an actual domain model, like we have a domain model because we have a domain with complex and ever-changing business rules, um, we have another problem, which is different ORM than so let's say we load up an entity in our RM and we go and set some properties on it through some operation as a group. And then we go save the object. Who decides what transaction happened? Turns out it's the RM. So most RMs work by loading up the object. You go set some properties on it. It keeps a copy of what you originally loaded. You go and mutate a different copy and then it goes and compares the two figures out, well, this value changed, this value changed. And that's kind of fine, but you know, how many lines of code are in the average ORM? And how much do you trust that they actually work in every single one? The problem is, if you're building a system that has a domain model in the first place, it should probably be in a system that's created for the business. Right? It's not supposed to be the general purpose pattern for simple parts of the system, transaction processing, like CRUD operations, that kind of thing. It's supposed to be in the area that you derive critical, that you actually derive value. So you probably don't want state changes to be delegated to like some technical component that may or may not be correct. I've seen examples where it's not correct. So from that, we can determine like, okay, so we're doing domain-driven design. We're talking about language. State changes, you know, all the state changes that can happen in the system, they, they should be an explicit part of the model and they should have names. So Eric, if you ask him what, what's missing out of the domain driven design book from 2004, um, he has a few different things and like some different ways of restructured. But the, the one pattern he says is missing is the domain event pattern. Um, so specifically, when we name state changes with a, with a name which means they finished happening, then what we have is an event. That's specifically a domain event, so it's named, it's part of the domain model. So we go through and look at uh, you know, a quick example here. If you think of the structural model of a shopping cart, you, know, you generally have the cart, you have some line items, maybe some shipping information. You can imagine exactly how, um, yeah, how this model would work. You, know, you go through, you add some items, you go and add a line item here, maybe you go remove something from the cart, you delete it again. So this is like the structural way of looking at it. But instead, we can look at it using the evented model, which is you know, recording what finished happening at every stage. So we can say we created the cart, we added two shirts, we added five socks, we removed one shirt, and then we checked out, like added shipping information. It's quite trivial to go from this model to this model, but unless you build special affordances into the data model in this kind of structural model, you actually can't go the other way because we're losing information. So you can build temporal databases, they're not, they're not that not strictly difficult to build, but unless you actually build support in for it at every stage, structural models are kind of lossy. But if you have this model instead, then we can just persist the domain model by persisting the events. And then we can go and rebuild the structural model um, from the events that we have. So that's basically event sourcing. Who considers themselves to be a functional programmer? Maybe a little bit? Okay. So the, the, the one liner of event sourcing for functional programmers is this. Current state of, a, of an object is a left fold of the previous behaviors. I actually have a really nice example of this in a, in a language uh, called Kotlin, which I can show you in a minute. Um, probably won't allow for a final change. Takes a left fold and then the final operation. Uh, sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, like, like, think if you're trying to calculate a mean, the variance, and standard deviation, and you keep track every time there's somebody X, some X goes in the end. Right. Then you need the final step to calculate the values. Right. So yeah, no, that's, that's true. Uh, so that's, but that's more of a projection than the actual state. Um, but yeah, you can, you can apply extra operations. Mm -hmm. to it, sure. um, you can also do it every step, right? And you, provided you have a mergeable, some, uh, merge, mergeably summarizable data, uh, data structure, you can do it every stage if you want. Um, so we could rebuild, like since we can rebuild from events and we can get back to the structural model that we have, like we could store the structural model as well because you know we have a million events. Maybe we don't want to go replay them every time because you know we have expensive calculations to do. But storing it is just some optimization. 
And it's one we can choose to take, or it's one we can choose not to take. But we should be able to blow away the, the caches of each of these and go rebuild it from first um, first principles, if you like. So in other words, the state is a second level derivative of the events, which are the you know, book of prime entry, if you like. Um, and actually, it's kind of interesting that we can project, project multiple different uh, there's no reason we have to pass the events through the same folder. We can take um, we can take the stream of events and replay it lots of different ways to produce lots of different structural models. And that's one of the real benefits of event sourcing is that you can go through and add these later and go and rebuild new models. Um, you know, obviously the data has to be relevant. You know, you don't project your dog's medical history from car service records, but you know that you could probably try. I guess they're largely similar. Um, so, um, this brings us on to like some of the implications that this has. Like, if you take this like slightly different way of looking at the structure of the system, then it has like much larger ramifications around the system than you think it might have. One of them is on testing. So, who tests the software? User. <laughs> yeah, normally the user, right? <laughs> Um, so who tests that their, software, that their software does what it's supposed to do? It's not a trick question, I promise you. Like, everyone does that. Who also tests that their software does not do what it's not supposed to do? Okay, that's how you do it. Please tell me the answer is not user event sourcing, because that's really fun. <laughs> um, that's actually a much, much harder thing to test for, because the number of side effects are basically limitless for a Turing complete system. Um, so testing when you get to event sourcing, you know, you've, you've limited the domain model to have basically you know, two concepts. You have commands and you have events. So tests become, you know, for an aggregate, tests become you know, when all these things have happened in the past and this one new thing happens, then the only thing that the domain model produces is events. But you can also assert that it doesn't produce any events it's not supposed to, right? And then you suddenly get testing that your system doesn't do what it's not supposed to do for free. Like by constraining, by defining the uh, aggregates in a calculus of themselves or of their own events, you suddenly have a much more constrained set of things to test around. Now you still have to test the downstream operations of the result of the decision that's made is implemented correctly. But at least you manage to decouple that from making the decision itself. And generally, separating policy and action is a good is a good thing in some way. So there's some uh, there's some nice little DSLs for doing this. This is one in C sharp. Um, yeah, there's another one. Um, they end up quite they end up being quite nice tests for domain models because they're specified in the language of the domain users themselves. You know, you can imagine um, you can imagine like a normal domain expert. Being able to take this, you know, strip out some of the syntax, maybe. But you can imagine them being able to express things in, like, given the account that had this, this, and this happen. When you know we record this complaint, then these are the actions that we need to take you know, with these conditions. Um, and this is actually, it turns out, like business users actually appreciate this because they're not being asked to reason about the internals of a system. They're being asked to reason about things in their own language, which is generally much easier. So the problem is, if we go back to event sourcing and think, okay, well now our database is this stream of events, then how are we going to query it? So let's say we have a stream per customer, and we're interested in all the customers whose name starts with a J. So, uh, and whose name starts with a J today, because I guess you could change that. So the only way we could do that, if all we had was the events, would be to you know, replay all the events for every stream and work out like by the time we get to the end, you know, does the name begin with J? That's really inefficient. So, um, mm -hmm. at least it's usually inefficient. So, the solution to, to um, the solution to that is a pattern called Command Query Responsibility Segregation, or CQRS for short. Um, you can tell it's now a thing because you can Google it, and it doesn't say, "Did you mean cars anymore?" <laughs> <laughs> um, I guess some people in here are familiar with that. <laughs> um, that was normally the case. Um, so, CQRS is a really simple pattern that gets far too much credit for like complexity. And the only thing that the pattern states is that you should service reads one way and writes another way um, through a different path. And the trivial example of this is you, know, you have an RDBMS, 
where you write into tables and read out of views, then you're effectively doing this pattern. But you can separate these systems and say, well, okay, we're going to write into an event stream, and then we're going to have the event stream project um, project different structural models that we can query in different ways suitable for the query. Then it becomes a much more powerful construct. So, you know, we can't have one model that's suitable for everything. Um, you know, there's the reason that people try and reverse engineer star schemas for you know, large scale reporting, and they don't do you know, online transaction queries on the same data. Um, but because we have like the source of events that made this thing true, we don't have to go and reverse engineer our reporting schema out of an online transaction database. We can just project it by applying a different fold to generate the model. Maybe we have like graph elements on it, so we can go replay all the events and build up a graph of relationships and do graph queries on it using near or something like that. <coughs> but the point of you know that's the point of CQRS is effectively to separate queries and commands, and that's that's basically the pattern. It's generally a good thing to apply anyway. Um, there's a like a, a smaller scale version of it called command query command query segregation or separation, something like that. One of the, the patterns out of Bertrand Meyer's object orientation books from the like, early 80s or something. Um, there are some places where it's really inconvenient to do, but in general, like well-written software, well-written object-oriented software does the same at the small scale. And then you know you build system architectures out of larger versions of the smaller thing. So what we end up with in like a system built like this, we end up with you know, a transaction log, um, which is uh, our events in this case. And then we end up projecting out different read models based on the events. So we might have you know, a bunch of static data in a document database. Uh, we might have a, a graph of relationships that we can query for connectivity. And then a SQL star schema where we can do like ad hoc reporting whenever. And then one of the nice things about event source systems is that these are all trivial to generate because we've kept all of the data available to us and we don't have to go and reverse engineer it out of what levels matter to keep along the way. So that's kind of the focus for what, um, like the background for the kinds of systems built with this. It's actually less important to cover these days because most people kind of understand this stuff now. Um, back when we first started talking about event sourcing, like it was never that well understood and I just spent like way more time talking about this. Um, so what I'm going to go through and talk about is a system that's built to act as a database that's specialized to act as the transaction log for events. So for people that have seen it, it's event store. For people who've not seen it, I'll demo it now. Um, we're going to look at the internals of it. Um, who here is a .NET programmer? Cool. Java? What else is there? Go? JavaScript. JavaScript. Okay. I have a particular dislike for JavaScript. But, uh, <laughs> um, that's cool. It's, it's fairly understandable for everyone. The database is actually written in C sharp. The tiny bit of C for interop, but um, so yeah, it's fairly straightforward for anyone that's familiar with, with Java, Scala, Kotlin, whatever. <laughs> it's pretty easy to to get into the database code and look around it. Um, I don't know if anybody's ever opened up another database. Like, if you go look at the Postgres source, it's like absolute mystery as to where anything is anyway. It's open source? It is open source. Okay. Um, so I see and I have a uh, I don't have a web browser for this thing. Uh, so the code is available github.com event can't see both screens. That's your event store and of course my connectivity is gone. No you yeah, got com spelled wrong. Oh yeah. So yeah, it's there. Um, the whole thing is like one repository. You can just clone it and build it. Um, it was built on, so unlike most .NET projects, we actually built on Mono first on Linux and then ported it to Windows. It turns out if you go in that direction, you don't have a bunch of portability problems. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I've moved for course CLR people, start on Linux, go back. Um, uh, so it's three clause BSD licensed, uh, if that's of interest. There's a bunch of interesting like, code that we'll look at in a second. You guys can pull out into projects for each purpose, which is why it's less and stuff. Like so if I go up and pull up a um, a event store node, uh, hold on, that's not what I'm looking for. Sorry, it's a Chelsea network graphic. Thank you. Um, uh, where am I? C.
build.sh work? Maybe. I might have it built somewhere, but I don't know where it is. I can't. Sorry. This is the point where, like, rather than <coughs> spending all day at work, I should have probably put time to do it there. Here we go. And the one I prepared earlier. You know, I need to see a mirror the displays. That's going to be easier. Okay, cool. So here's the here's the binary that we saw. So to start the database, we can just do like uh, events um, event store D. Um, we'll just store the data in memory. A whole bunch of options we could use for that, but that should work. And then we'll get a bunch of log spam, and then we're good. So if I go to localhost um, two one one three. Cool, there's my database. Uh, admin change it as the default password. <laughs> okay. Um, so this is like the main monitoring screen of it. And then there's a stream browser, which um, has some streams already there. But let's take a quick look at the HTTP interface. Uh, there's like a fast TCP interface that you can normally get you know, between 30 and 50,000 requests a second through, um, through a cluster. Uh, using TCP and protocol buffers, but there's also a um, uh, there's also an HTTP interface that uses atom feeds. Because if you think about what a stream of events is, it's like entries strictly ordered, which have like some metadata associated with them, and then the actual data. Um, if you go through like what atom was designed, it was designed to like send out blocks, right? But it turns out actually they're not that similar from each other. <laughs> This is one of those great examples of a thing that seemed like a really good idea at the time was to use Atom because like every platform has an Atom parser. And it turns out that like Atom is actually incompletely specified. So every platform has a broken <laughs> Atom parser, which is actually completely different than the one you um, That might be something we go rational at some point. But, um, so this is going to be kind of hard to see because the screen is kind of small. But basically, I can probably. You can move that to camera right. Uh, here we go. Turn this on. Shortcuts. Uh, that's not what I want. That's what I want. Scroll with mouse. So, let's say we have a stream up here. So our URI for the stream is, you know, database. It could be the clusters, IP addresses, any of the cluster nodes. And then we're going to talk to the slash streams because we want to write into a stream. And then this is going to be our stream name. Hello world. We're going to post into that. Um, and there's a few headers that we can use. So we can say like, what type of event is this? So this, you know, this is the type of event a thing happens so that we can like, switch on the schema when we're reading them. Um, we're gonna throw in application JSON. And we're gonna give the event an ID. And then down here we have like the body of the thing. So this is just, this is just JSON. That's cool. So if I were to you know, run this request, then, is that wrong? Yeah, the Zoom thing's getting there. I think it ran. Yeah, there we go, it ran. So I have a stream called Hello World. It has one event in it. You can see the type of the event. There we go into it. You get the body of the event. That's fairly straightforward. We look at the response that came back. Um, yeah, we got, we got our event number assigned. So as you write into this thing, you can have concurrent writers writing into the same stream. And events will always be serialized. So you won't get conflicts when you get there. You won't get two events with the same number. You won't get all that kind of stuff to be dealt with. One of the problems that you have, though, is concurrency control. So if I'm user A and I'm you know, user B and we're writing into the same stream, you need to be able to, like, there's a few policies you can apply. One of them is like last write wins, common in, data, in like, relational databases. Um, there's all kinds of policies applied for this for like, <laughs> Depending on the reporting structure, the organization, the most bizarre one I've seen is like most senior officer wins, regardless of where they're right actually arrived. <laughs> um, so we have some way of dealing with that. So we go, um, yeah, so we write our first event, let's go write a different event. So we have a different quantity down here. Again, we're just saying we're going to append it to the screen because we're not specifying like everything. So we so go write right that. Someone's Someone. echoing. Can you see it? Can you, can you, can you, can you, can you. 
Yeah, yeah. Can I just mute your speaker? And we can, hold on. Uh, yeah, it's you. Okay, I don't know how you do that. Not. Uh, okay, probably whoever owns the meeting can mute everyone. Can you click the mute button on this one? No, no, no. Actually, I probably do need to be muted, right? You can be muted, yeah. Actually, that's bad. <coughs> that has, oh, muted, yeah. okay, it was me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we wrote our first event in, then we wrote a second event into the same stream. And if we go back to the response of that, we can see that this one was assigned to number one. It was second in the stream. We go back over to our stream browser. Uh, if we go back to our stream here, we have yeah, we have a thing happened at zero, and then we have a different thing happened as one. So that's fine if we have like single things happening, but quite often you might have a batch of events that you want to atomically write to the database. So this thing produces three or four different events from the result of one operation. You want either all to be committed or none of them to be committed. Uh, so there's a way you can do that by putting in um, you know, multiple payloads into the same request. Um, can't see that. Um, so at this point, the event ID comes out for headers, goes into the payload, and there's a custom media type for it. Um, so we could go do that. But let's assume this was a write that came out of you know one of these concurrency situations where we have like user A and user B competing to write to the same you know, object in the system effectively, which correlates to the same stream in the database. Um, so you think about how you deal with optimistic concurrency. You, know, you can do pessimistic concurrency really easily with locks, but um, if we want to do optimistic concurrency, then the way we do that in a relational database is you do like you know, update x set. Update table set x equals y mm. if or where, and then like list all of the old values for all the fields, or list like some um, timestamp or like vector dot or something like that. So our equivalent of this for event store, let's think through the flow for a second, and we can say, well, okay, so user A loaded all the events for this object, and then user B loaded all the events for this object. User A loaded like four events, rebuilt their state, was available for a command to be played on. User B did the same thing. So they both know, like, the state I performed this command on was as of event number four in the system. So we expect the stream to be at version four, event number four. And they both expect that. So when they commit their results, they can say, I expect that the stream is at four. If it's not at four, then, like, you should throw back an error rather than just writing. Or, like, overwriting someone's data, which you can't do, or, like, appending it to the end anyway, which will end up with logical consistency. So what we can say is if uh, if they both expect the stream to be at four and one of them writes, even if they write at the same time, the system is going to linearize these requests because it processes everything series internally. And only one of these things is going to succeed. Because the first one, let's say it's B, their events get written. So now the stream is at like version six because they appended two events. When A's request gets processed, you know, they have this way of saying, well, I expect the stream is at version 10 in this case. Um, the stream is no longer a 10, you know, let's say it's a 12 because you know, the other person wrote their stuff. So this guy will get back an error. So if we run that request, um, we get a 400 wrong expected version. What we do with that, well, okay, what do you do with any concurrency failure? Right? You either surface it to the user or maybe you just like retry. You could like maybe compare the events that have been written between the time that, you know, between time you expected it now and see if any of them conflict. You can apply like a custom policy to say like, well, this guy's more senior than this guy, so his rights win. Um, yeah, we're gonna just like put in some compensating action and then write his events anyway. Um, there's any kind of policy that you like, you can apply using this model, provided you have the ability to detect when a concurrency violation has happened, and then the ability to retry whatever write you're trying to do once you've corrected it. So a common way is to say like, you know, pop up a message of the user saying, you know, someone else edited this while you were doing it. Here's what they did. Like, what do you want to do? Do you want to, like, go ahead with your change anyway? Do you want to, like, back out your change? Do you want to, like, or if it's, like, an automatic business rule processing, maybe just reapply the rule and say, well, if the state changes between them didn't affect the outcome of the rule, then we're going to write anyway. Otherwise, we get rid of this new result because we think it's an issue. So 
you can apply like whatever policy you like based on this. Um, there's a whole book to be written about <coughs> currency in advanced source systems. There was also until recently a, a whole book to be written about versioning in advanced source systems, but then Greg went and wrote it last year. So that one's done. So that's like a batch of events uh, with the wrong version number. Um, if we go back to our stream, we actually expect it to be at version one because we appended two events to it. So if we go put the correct version number in the CS expected version header, then uh, go and execute this request. This one will succeed. So we've got 201 created. Um, yeah, we get back to pointer to the first one. But both of these events are actually well, such one event, but it's been committed. Another question like that comes up in distributed systems a lot, especially ones that use HTTP, is what are the semantics around failure? So let's assume that I, as a client, am talking to an event source server over here. So I make my request, the server processes the request, and just as it's about to start sending bits on the wire to tell me that the request has succeeded, the connection drops. Um, because you know, someone cuts through the fiber or something, which has happened twice in the last year for us. Um, turns out that's like a major incident for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Screws up routing all over the place. But um, the database thinks the request succeeded, and the client doesn't know what happened. So what's the client supposed to do? Like maybe the client can't even maybe the client gets partitioned for days and like can't talk to the database, so it can't go and verify its own state. And meanwhile, everything's moved on. But this is important data from the client that shouldn't be lost. So when the client comes back online and is able to connect again, what's it supposed to do? Like it could go and like reconcile its own state with the with the server, but we chose a slightly different model because we're an append-only immutable database. What we can do is send the exact same request again, and you'll get the same response back as you would have got originally. So, in this case, you know, we sent this request here once. Uh, sorry, we sent it once um, with expected version one, and our our write succeeded. We actually got back that it succeeded. <coughs> if we imagine we never got that response. Now, our job as a client is to just retry the same request. And provided we retry the same request, you know, I can, it's kind of fast because I'm local, but you can see no matter how many times I do this, the result doesn't change. The timestamp changes. Uh, so if we watch the timestamp here, it's updating, it's updating. But I get back as a client the same response that I would have got back when I originally made the request. So I actually make uh, retry handling really easy. Just you know, keep retrying. Go ahead. What if someone else had? Put another event in. Um, so provided your event is the same as the one that you were expecting that should have been written at that position, then you'll get back the correct response. What if uh, someone changed this, this state of the event? Well, when you were trying to send the same event to change it back, so that I mean, retrospect, you know, with read models, you have okay. a rollback. So this didn't write the event again? All it did is return the status code for the request as if it had. So if we go back to our stream, you know, I've just run it like five times. So let me run it a couple more times here. If we go back to our event stream now, you know, you, one way of looking at this is I might have like that event like all the way down again, like five times written again. <laughs> but actually what we have, go away. Like seriously? <laughs> actually what we have is three events in our stream. So it's correlated the event number, the event ID, and the contents of the event, and realized this is the same thing. Yeah, this is a request which has already succeeded that's being retried. So we're just going to return the success status code that we would have returned normally. And that's because you're using the event ID. Uh, the current it, or the uh, expected sequence number or whatever. Yes. Okay. If you don't use expected sequence numbers, then you only get this behavior within like some number of events because there's a window, a cache window, and event number. So you created your database at the time? Um, it's an index query. Uh, it's not a database query. So uh, we'll talk about how that works actually shortly. Um, so then, you know, that's writing. Let's look at reading. So, you know, we get a stream and we get back, um, we get back an atom feed. Turns out there's actually no standard representation of atom feeds in JSON. And who likes parsing XML? I do. Actually, I prefer it to JSON legitimately <laughs> for lots of reasons because it like has schema and stuff and isn't just like an arbitrary blob of crap. But um, turns out no one else likes that, so here we go. <laughs> um, the actual reason we did it is we needed it for the UI because we didn't want to write next to help JavaScript. 
Um, if we just go look at the structural view of this, then you know, we have some information about the stream, and then we have entries into the stream. Uh, so we have entries here, and each entry in the stream represents one event. Um, Atom feeds kind of idiosyncratic, they go backwards in time, so the, the entry zero in the top of the feed is actually the most recent event, and you have to work your way backwards. So depending on the headers you send, you can either read the stream forwards or backwards. Mm -hmm. And both have different use cases. If you're trying to replay everything from scratch, reading from the start makes sense. If you're trying to replay back to a known point, it makes more sense to read from the end until you get back to the number that you wanted. Um, if you assume that you know you might have missing sequence <coughs> numbers for whatever reason, what if you don't in event store. Would you... What about snapshots? So this is exactly the case for snapshots. So let's say you have a snapshot of like a, a memoization of your fold up to point you know, 150. You read the top of the stream and you're at event 153. So you know there are like three events to go back and read. So you can just go backwards rather than going forwards. So rather than going to 150 and reading forwards, you can just read until you hit the last snapshot number. And then the snapshot stored in the event store, is that separate? Uh, you can store snapshots wherever you like. So you can put them in their own stream. Um, depends how big they are, it's not a good idea generally. Um, it, it, managing them can get kind of awkward because they can get kind of big. Uh, so that's the top of a stream, and then you know, we could go get the individual event. Um, don't do this. Um, like we're getting a link here, which um, isn't part of the public spec. Yeah. The correct way to read individual events is to read the stream and then follow the links, rather than assuming that you can construct the URL in a particular style. Um, but for the purposes of this demo, it's easier to just do this. We don't know what structure is, um, but it's not guaranteed. And then we do too. Well, so and everybody does. It's not. It's not actually a big secret, and it has never changed. But like, we don't guarantee it will never change. If something else makes more sense, then like, we could change it. Um, if you hard coded URLs like URL builders, then tough. If you follow the links, it will just be one link. Like actual hyper medium, huh? Yeah. <laughs> um, so you can go back and read like the individual contents of events. Um, what was this one? Okay, so this is interesting. So the other operation you can do is a subscribe. And this is where I'm gonna have to go and fill up some more code. Because I have a little example of how that can work. So you can subscribe to any stream in the database and it will push you notifications when an event gets written to. The other thing you can do is subscribe to all events. Uh, hmm. I think that's it. So the problem is I wrote this code almost a month ago. So there's probably been like five different versions of the .NET CLI by now. And it probably won't compile anymore. But let's see if it does. Um, this is a, like just a little program that subscribes to events. Um, um, so it connects to the database. Um, and then it subscribes to a stream. Um, in this case, it's using a special type of subscription where it will go to the start of the stream. It will read all the events and push them to you. And then it will switch into real-time pushes so that for future events, they'll get pushed to you as well. So this is really useful for building view models. Uh, so you start at all and you start at the first event in the database. It will go through, it will push every event to you in the correct order. And then it will switch into real-time polling mode. So like, it will push you the events as they get. As they get written. Yeah. You, you said you can subscribe to all yeah. from all streams. You can do that. So all consistent ordering yes. across all streams. Yes. All the time. Yes. There's a consistent ordering across all streams. I'll show you how that's implemented in a second. Um, how, how is this pushing it to you? Like what means? TCP. Uh, or you can do it via long polling on, on over HTTP. But this is uh, so this holds open hold open sorry. Each client holds open a long-lived full duplex TCP connection to the database, and then there's a you know there's a subscribe a subscription filter on the database side that filters based on your subscriptions and has like a distribution point. Is there a way to tell it to pause or slow down? Yes, you have that right here. But, um, if you don't consume them at the correct rate and you start filling up the send windows, then it will disconnect you and you get like a notification on the client. 
You can subscribe us that way. Can you grab the stream? Does that work? There is an RX wrapper, but we don't have it. Like we didn't do it ourselves. <coughs> There's a wrapper that will turn you into an observable, like observable event or something like that. Um, so if I run this, let's see if we're. Come on. Using mono. Oh dear. Okay, so actually this is good. Oh, this is good. Um, so we got two events because we we subscribed to the Hello World stream and we had two of those. Or I think. Yeah, we subscribe to the Hello World stream from event number zero. Um, okay, so let's go write another event in and let's see what that does. Um, so I think if I write another event here, yeah, there we go. So it got written to the database. Um, its event ID was what, uh, 2068. And then our, in our event handler here, we got pushed that down to our subscription. So we could go here and like update every poll. Um, it's actually an optimization. There's nothing that you couldn't do with polling, but you, you tend to get a much lower latency if you do subscription polling. Um, Did you have four events or stream? I did have four events in my event stream, and I've seen this before. Um, it's a bug in Rider where the console doesn't connect to the process fast enough. <laughs> I promise you it's not broken. Actually, no. No, 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 hold on. You need to start from minus one. You actually need to start from minus one. Yeah. No, sorry, you're right. <laughs> there is also a bug in Rider where it doesn't connect to the process, but they may have fixed that. Uh, so actually, so the semantic of this is not what's the next event you need. It's the last, what's the last event you saw? Because you can transactionally record the last event you saw with the result. So you know, let's say you're writing to a SQL database. You can transactionally write into the SQL database, this was the result of event number one. You start from event number one and you'll get the next one, which is probably two, but it doesn't have to be two. It could be 50 or something like that. There are reasons that events can be missing. Um, it's not common to find, but there are reasons they can be missing. So, um, one of the things you can do is age out events. So, you can say, I'm only interested in keeping events which are like, uh, uh, which have, like, you can set a meta metadata key on the event, which is a time to live. You won't get the event number reused, so you'll get like gaps in the sequence. If you have like a bunch of stuff which is you know, TTL hasn't expired, then you have like an event whose TTL has expired, that event goes away. So you can go from like three to, to five if two events have gone away. But so you don't actually know what the next event you want, you want is at any point. So you just record the last one you have and you can put it out there. Um, yes, yeah, good point. So actually, if we run that again. Um, there's actually a, a constant for this as well. It's like event position. Uh, I don't know. There's, there is a constant for it. What's, what's the overlap with sort of like half that's expected version? Expected version. No, that's for writing. Uh, there is a there is a constant. I, and I could go find it, but like minus one is what it resolves to, so whatever. <laughs> so Kafka, if, if all you do is subscribe to the all stream and write into like one stream, then what you have is effectively a single shot of Kafka. Um, there are slightly different durability guarantees. Um, Kafka is optimized for performance or optimized for durability. You can tune events, but you can tune Kafka to get to do the same durability, to give you the same durability guarantees as event store, and you can tune Event stores give you the same performance as Kafka. Um, the flags, by the way, are, hold on, close that for a second. Um, yeah, there we go. Um, they're called things like um, unsafe disable flush to disk. Uh, we make you type unsafe because they are unsafe, and Kafka shouldn't really be shipping with that as a feature. But, you know, benchmark driven. Does you can and you can't. So, uh, what event store does not do for you is automatic sharding. Yeah, um, my next question would be how do you keep global order? You can't keep global order. There's, like, it's, a, it's not a problem that's solvable in a reasonable way. Yeah. Um, what you can do is have like some kind of global vector clock, and you can get like K ordering based on time or something. But um, you can get close to it. But unless you've got like atomic blocks in every VC, 
which is not an unreasonable thing to do in 2017. Like it's not a solving problem. Um, and Kafka doesn't do it across partitions either. It only keeps yeah. ordering within a partition. So. so yeah, so if you write into one stream and you subscribe to all, then what you have is effectively Kafka. The interesting thing is that you can effectively, that one transaction log is multiplexed into lots of different streams. And you can say, like, I'm interested in shopping cart one, two, three, four. And it's an indexed operation to go and read all of the events related to that particular thing. Whereas in Kafka, it's like a replay everything, go find the events because it's not there. They're actually a lot more similar than they are different. Um, a lot of the implementation details are kind of similar. Um, but you have a query, query away flag instead of their index. Right, yeah, you exactly. did It's optimized for small, for, it's optimized for having hundreds of millions of streams. Or, like, as many streams as you like, I guess, it's more accurate. It's a stream, uh, the stream name is a string. Um, they're, they're, they're double hashed for the index. Um, they used to be single hashed, and we actually found hash collisions. Like, um, we used to use MoMA, MoMA3, and now we, the index has MoMA3 and XX hash for stream name. I actually go into that a bit more detail. So, um, so, uh, so actually, let's see if that worked with minus one. Uh, of course, I terminated the database. So. It works with minus one. I'm just going to set that key for a second. Uh, let's go back to some slides. So. Um, there he is. Okay, so, um, okay, so it's gonna go through these briefly. So it's the transaction log, uh, the three basic operations we already looked at, um, different interfaces on it. So you can either talk over TCP, in which case you get like full duplex protocol buffers. Oh, thank you. I was yeah. just about to look at that. Um, you can talk over HTTP, in which case you get atom plus JSON or atom plus XML. Uh, or you can embed the thing in your application directly. So if you have a, a .NET application, there's like you can just go directly over. You just keep everything local, and you have like effectively a cluster built into your, <coughs> into your own app. Um, da -da. It's liberally licensed, open source. Um, as I was explaining to Adam earlier, like we chose that for a reason. The reason is we were going to do AGPL because we wanted like to get paid. Um, but someone pointed out to us like it's spelled AGPL because the middle finger is silent. So, like, <laughs> it's actually BSD licensed. It turns out, like, anyone who's going to pay for it would have sort of broken the GPL. It wasn't going to pay for it, but it was sort of break the GPL. So, yeah. um, okay. So, the overall architecture, like, so let's think through, like, some of the desirable properties for building a database server or for building, like, any high concurrency application. <laughs> so, like, this is effectively a miniature sort of service oriented architecture in and of itself. <coughs> um, so we want to be modular enough that if we want to replace something in the, you know, let's say we want to replace the HTTP interface because we don't want to speak Atom anymore. Or let's say we want to replace TCP because we like we want to use something better than protobufs. Or we want to replace the disk writer because some new file system's coming along that has like great properties for this kind of thing. Like we don't want any of those things to mean we have to go rewrite everything. So we kind of want loose coupling of all these components. Um, we want to support a lot of clients because you can subscribe, like you can support like real time, like down to the client. Um, so you see like occasions where people have like thousands and thousands of clients connected to this thing to receive and push events. Uh, kind of a bit like, uh, what's it called, Firebase? Is it Firebase, is that the thing? Yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. Um, and there was another one that did something similar and then they got bought and shut down. Uh, Reef, uh, no, not Reef. I can't remember. There are like so many databases now. <laughs> I've lost track. Um, but we want to support like tens of thousands of clients. <coughs> we want to degrade gracefully under load, so we don't want to end up with a situation where like adding the 10,000th client suddenly makes it not work for anyone. Um, we want to be operations friendly, so we want to be able to monitor different critical points in the system and know, like, be able to determine where the bottlenecks are. We want to self-tune, so we don't want to like have like, uh, I say we don't want to have like a billion command line options, we actually have like quite a lot. But um, like ideally, you shouldn't have to set very many of them beyond like here's the IP address, like here's the interface that lines you, that kind of thing. But for the most part, you don't. So we want like we want the system to recognize um, 
the kind of load profile that it's seeing and adjust like the number of you know, adjust its its makeup to be able to deal with that kind of throughput automatically without us having to do it. So yeah, how do you write concurrent servers? There are two different ways traditionally. The first is you do like a thread-based model. So you think back to like Apache HTTP or like web forms or like uh, what is it? Uh, um, JBoss, that kind of thing. The way that works is you have events coming out of the network, they queue in the NIC, basically, or in the operating systems, TCP stack or whatever. There's some kind of dispatcher and it dispatches um, packets, it dispatches like bits of work to a thread for every request that's going on in the system. The request is written synchronously, implemented using a thread in the operating system. It services one request as a synchronous code and like, the operating system schedule is what does the work. So you know, it will go do its work and then it will reply, go back out into the network. Um, so the operating system is doing the overlapping of computation, you know, scheduling mm -hmm. that down onto the available resources, same for IO. So the problem is like how many, how many threads is reasonable for an operating system to be running at once? Um, the answer is like, it depends what operating system you're sure. so, yeah. You're on FreeBSD, you can get up to like a few million. You're on Solaris, you can get up to the same. You know, you're on Windows, not that dissimilar. Um, if you're on like Mac OS, then you're talking like 100,000 maybe. Like it's not very good at that. Um, so what you tend to see like, as if you have a thread for every request, then by definition, you have like one for every client at least, right? Because you have to maintain heartbeats. And <laughs> so what you tend to see is these systems where as the number of threads like increases, so the number of requests go up, the throughput of the system initially goes up and then goes down very dramatically and the latency goes up at the same time. So, you know, when too many people are connected, everything gets worse for everyone because the OS scheduler can't keep up with context switching between all the requests that it could service at a particular time. It's particularly compounded when you have like a lot of things that can handle on one resource and you don't have very many cores. So let's say an event became available to distribute out to all the subscription, but then you'd have like this one thing in the system precipitates and sending out data over like 15,000 sockets. So you're going to have like 15,000 threads have to be scheduled to go send this data. It kind of doesn't work very well. So the other model is event-driven stuff. So this event-driven interface has started to appear in, um, I guess KQ was first, maybe. Um, IO completion ports in Windows, event ports in Solaris, and ePoll in uh, Linux. So these are all ways that treat things differently. So instead of having a request per thread, what you have, sorry, a, a thread per request, what you have is a finite state machine per request. You have a single thread doing all the work, and the operating system tells you when these things are ready to happen. So this is how like node works, for example. Um, you have an event loop, things happen, you respond to events, you have an FSM for every request in the system, and uh, each request comes out, you, there's a, an event ready for it, you load the state up, you do your state transitions, you go through your work, you queue more events up for the next thing. This actually gives us like, this actually gives us significantly better performance because we're not context switching all the time. You know, there's no like stacks, there. there's no switching out stacks for, for different threads. Um, the problem with it is it's kind of a complex programming model. Like, has anybody ever tried writing like to KQ or EPOL and C? Like, it's kind of awkward. Like, the interface is not particularly friendly. And there are some abstractions around it which make it slightly more friendly. Like, libuv is one of them. Um, there's like a thing that gives the semantics of KQ across all of them. But, but ultimately, you have to like write all the state machine handling itself, and it's no fun. It's not like ACA. Because ACA, ACA kind of is a different thing. Um, ACA does green threads, which is, we'll talk more about green threads in a bit. Go does the same. Um, the, bear in mind, when we did the system, neither Go or ACA were a big thing. So like, this is kind of old, somewhat old information. I'll talk more about green threads in a minute because they have their own problems. Um, but their load profile, load the axes are actually different this time because like, I couldn't be bothered drawing these graphs, so I just found them, but they had different axes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, however, if I go through it, so the number of, we, rather than having threads and requests now, we have like tasks in our pipeline. So these things, um, these are like events that have happened, like ready to, to do some work. Um, you know, initially the throughput increases as the number of tasks goes up. And then at some point it degrades, but like the degradation is much more smooth. There's a lot less of a like, you know, suddenly everything's gone. And if you, you know, you stop 
allowing tasks to queue, then you don't end up with this like giant problem. So what we ideally like is something that matches the programming model of threads and it allows us to use some of like these asynchronous primitives so that we can get better performance out of our system or better characteristics out of our system. So there's a model called SADA, State of Entry and Architecture. This is written, it was a PhD at Berkeley in like the early 2000s who did this with Java. And what it attempt, attempts to do, it stands for staged event-driven architecture. What it aims to do is bridge like the gap between threaded systems and um, asynchronous systems. Um, so let's look at how it, how it works. So the basic building block is a stage, and a stage, if we like dig down to it, has three things. It has an input queue. So this is its command queue that it's going to work on. Actually, kind of very similar to Arca. It has an event handler, which is the code that's going to run in response to an event arriving. And then it has some number of threads which are going to go to the work. <coughs> so that might be one thread, or it might be if we need to linearize, or it might be like a pool of threads if we want to distribute the work. Again. So the way this works is each stage gets inbound events and produces outbound events. That's mostly true. There are some edge protocols, like there are some protocol stages where like we talk TCP on the outside rather than events and produce events on the inside. But you know, for the most part, stages in the system consume input events and produce output events having done some work. So if we take a look at like the like a simplified version of the event source stages, um, you know, these are some of the stages in there. So we have like a TCP handler, an HTTP handler, um, a disk writer service, a disk reader service. Um, there's a request management service, which is effectively the finite state machine for every request. And then there's like an authorization service that has all the ACLs loaded into it so that you can authorize it or not, depending on what. Uh, I didn't show that, but there's like an authorization system. Also. And then there's also some statistics, which I'm going to avoid talking about for a minute. So let's trace a request through the system. So let's say we get at the HTTP layer, we get like a get for streams, my stream. So we're, we're trying to read um, 10 events. I think, I forget which way around this is, because you're not supposed to create them like this, but I think it's, you're going to read 10 events starting at event number 20 from the stream called my stream. So this thing arrives at the HTTP handler. And what that's going to do is convert it into the first event that's going to trigger this request, which is a read stream forward command. So that's going to go over to the request manager service. And the request manager service is going to say, OK, here's like the FSM for this request. This is like the state associated with this request. And the first thing it has to do is go read the events off disk. Yeah, it might read them out of a cache, but conceptually it has to go get them off the disk somehow. So it's going to send its own command off to the disk reader service, which is read events, another command. So the disk reader goes, does its work. You know, this is one of these things where you know we probably have like you know, six or eight threads or something reading from disk, because you can parallelize it quite nicely. Context switching doesn't get too bad. Eventually the disk reader is going to come back with an event, which is read events was completed. And these are going to have like all the parameters on them, you know, pointer back to the original, you know, to the byte array that it read off this. Um, so the request manager, can, you know, will eventually get this read events completed. It can start, like, if you go back to processing, it knows the next thing I have to do once I've got the events, so I've got the ACL as well, is authorize the request. So is the user who made the request allowed to actually read these events or not? Um, and in this case, you know, so we send an authorized request command down to the authorization service. It responds with an authorization denied. So in this case, no is not allowed to read them. The request manager at that point can return to the HTTP um, endpoint and say read stream forward completed, and that will have like a result on it of like not authorized or something. And then that translates into HTTP forward through forbidden. Has anybody ever studied like operating system architecture? Cool. Right. Well, it hasn't actually changed that much. Um, this is actually very similar to what the system call layer of an operating system does, right? Everything inside an operating system, most, for the most part, is based on queues. But because of like POSIX, we have the system call interface. Well, not POSIX, because of like traditional Unix. We have um, the system call interface, which presents a synchronous API. So what we have to do is model an asynchronous operation as a synchronous API. That's effectively what we do here. So we hold open your HTTP connect, your TCP connection to your HTTP. Go do all the work internally asynchronously, and then either the request will time out before it gets a reply, or it will get resolved by some event in the system, and you can go reply. Uh, 
Yeah, this might not be the point. Why did you why did you hit the disk before you check the application? Because um, if you have a hundred million streams, you can't have a cache of all the apples. Um, and the Apple, is the ACL, the access controller, sorry, um, they are stored on the disk with the with um, okay. the stream metadata in the index. So it has to go load them. And if we're going to load it anyway, we may as well load it to, um, like, we may as well do all the disk at once versus like authorizing it and then going back and doing two things. So, um, it makes a lot more of a difference on a spinning disk than it does on an SSD. Um, there are actually things that like self-optimize for that, but like changing the message flow in response to the type of disk is going to be so much. So, so the upshot of this: so stages can only communicate by passing messages in a queue. They're not allowed to like make RPC calls to each other. Everything is fully asynchronous. Who's written Node before? On Node. I'm sorry. Yeah. Um, uh, yes. Uh, written something to use Node, not. Has worked on the mobile <laughs> side. <laughs> uh, what happens when you go debug? There you go. That tells you all you need to know. That like exhale of oh, fuck. Um, the problem is like when you do this style of messaging, all your context has gone away because you don't have a call stack that goes from like the HTTP layer all the way down. What you have instead is like the queue handler has pulled something off off a queue, so the only context you have is what's contained in the message. So the real problem is that continuations are explicit. Now, depending on whether you think it's a good thing or not, um, like you don't get a stack trace, basically. So you have to have some way of instrumenting the system to be able to trace a request through it. Um, this is a common problem with like large-scale microservice architectures as well, and people come up with things like Zipkin, um, open tracing, that kind of stuff, to log requests all the way through the system. We have something internally which does basically the same thing for debugging. Um, but what you can't do is like look at a stack trace and see it from HTTP down to disk because these things are disconnected in terms of time and there's queues between them. Um, the upshot of that is, on the other hand, who's like who's ever tried debugging like stuff using async and await in C sharp? Because that's not funny either. Right? And like I take this over that any day because at least the code that we've written is our code versus like generating stuff. From so the messages are usually immutable. So the messages that pass between stages um, ideally should be immutable. There are cases where we don't want them to be entirely immutable because we don't want to copy around like giant byte arrays of data all the time. Um, but logically, all these messages should be immutable. Uh, there's some performance optimization techniques we use where like, yeah, we know we're going to have hundreds of thousands of like read stream event forward messages. So what we do is allocate like, you know, 100,000 of them up front and then we reuse them. So like rather than abandoning them and making the garbage collector come along, we like slab allocate all of the same type of thing in one region of memory, and then like check them out, check them back in again. Um, all the code for doing that is obviously in the It's pretty straightforward. So when you say read stream for you talk about passing around file handle? Not the file handle. So if we go back to like how requests flow through, like let's say this read event event, this is like a type, a message, like a message is implemented as a class. We're going to have like hundreds of thousands of instantiations of this class. What we don't want to do is like new up a new one, go malloc, and then like it's release has a garbage. Around around. To an array. Yes. So we pass around pointers to arrays, but then also we reuse the structures themselves and pass around pointers. To okay. This is a performance optimization. If you were to take that away, it would work in the same way, just a lot slower. Um, C sharp not handle that or something like uh, language. <laughs> <laughs> it's got better at it over time, but it doesn't just do cool allocation. It has like at least it has primitives in the framework now to do pull allocation, which it never used to, because um, they needed it for like once they finally stopped using a thread per request for ASP dot that, they realized that everything else was slow as fuck, <laughs> <laughs> and had to like go and redesign basically the entire framework to like make it as fast as the new website they had. So like there's a bunch of high performance stuff that found its way into dot that. Actually, like ASP dot that is pretty expensive. Um, okay, this is an important point. Messages get processed by stages in the order they arrive in. So the input queue means that the order it arrives, you know, let's say the disk writer, is basically the order the things <coughs> are going to get written to disk. Modulo disk control is lying to you, which they do. Um, I'll talk more about that in a second. How long do we have, by the way? 
Right. Hey, I have a flight at 6 a.m. Okay. <laughs> um, so despite that, so although we have like, so the threads are the main source of concurrency in this system. We're not like single threaded here. Um, the optimal number of cores to have is like one per service or like M per service, depending. So you keep all the threads on a CPU all the time. But because you can, like, so when we're talking about supporting self tuning, like, we can start to do things like say, well, this disk is really slow. So we're going to want a bunch of threads waiting on IO. So we can adjust the pool sizes automatically based on like the latency of the disk. <coughs> this is really important when you start talking about the difference between SSDs and spinning rust. Because spinning rust like is, I forget the exact numbers here. I should know them pretty well. You just spend like all day doing the damn disk. Um, but it's like what, like 100 milliseconds maybe to, to seek and maybe less than 50 milliseconds, something like that, depending on like how far you've got to go across the platter. You can be waiting like 50 milliseconds for a response to come back from a spinning disk, especially as they've got much uh, denser. Um, more if you have to go to error correction. If you're on an SSD, that's like less than one millisecond for the most part. Um, so these are like radically different performance characteristics. And you can start to measure that and adapt the number of threads working on this problem so that you, end, you don't end up with like every thread blocked on a really slow disk. Actually, the cost of context switching at that point isn't that high because every thread, no threads are in a run of the state. Do you also uh, have a cost? So I mean, like you have stuff attached to the CPU. Right, yes. So you have a cost between going to another CPU for that. Right, you have a cost for that. And actually, the, the biggest thing that didn't apply when we started doing this and does apply now is as machines have got bigger, their path to memory has got like way different. So if I have a two socket CPU now, the cost of accessing half the memory from socket A is now way higher than the cost of accessing it from socket B because it's directly connected to the socket. Otherwise, you have to go over the CPU cross connect. And that gets really expensive. That's actually more of a problem for us than the CPU caches because it's important for some things, but like we're not. It's fast, but it's not that fast. So it doesn't make that much difference. Um, there was like one place in the code where we had to like pad the cache lines because otherwise they were thrashing. I can't remember where it was. I do remember having to do it. Um, it caused this particular problem because for years people were trying to build this on like 32 bit system. <coughs> we're like, stop it. Like, it's not 1996. Like, AMD 64 has existed since like 2000. Just to be real. We actually don't do 32 bit builds anymore. We detect 32 bit pointers and crash up front. <laughs> it's like, no, not dealing with this. Not my problem. <laughs> um, uh, okay, where are we? Oh, yeah. So, although um, although we're not like a single event loop, you are still like taking a resource, which is the thread, when you process a message. So, you still shouldn't be doing like giant blocky pools. Better to delegate them to pools of workers. Um, okay, so this one's kind of interesting. We talked a minute ago about like reading from disk. Let's talk about writing to disk instead. Um, how long does Nash Sync take? Actually, so does everyone know what Nash Sync is? Which one can remember this? Like you want Find to synchronize that. everything that's in the right. memory cache. So when you do a write to a disk, like you call write, if you're in C, you call like write to a file descriptor. You return when the operating system has acknowledged that write. That does not mean it's on the disk. In fact, it almost certainly means it's not on the disk. So there's a command to say, like, I really want this data to be on the disk. Don't return until this data is on the disk. And that's called f-sync for file, so file sync for disk. Um, yeah, it turns out that, like, that made drives look really slow. So drive manufacturers put in, like, systems to lie to you about when the data is on disk. <laughs> so their disk looks better in benchmarks, but actually, like, the data still isn't great. How do you actually get there? Uh, there is actually, the only way you can guarantee it's there is I, there is no guaranteed way for every list, but it's a difference based on this. Some like expensive disks, you can turn that off. Yeah. Um, the best way of doing it is to buy disks that have a backup capacitor in them that's enough to write that write cache down to the disk. And that way, if the power fails, like the writes will still make it to the disk. Um, the way we try and make sure they're into, I'll write that a second. Um, but like the F sync time, again, across different types of devices is wildly different. Like for a, an F sync to a um, to a spinning drive is like what, 50 to 100 milliseconds, maybe, um, depending on how many buffers it's got to write down. Uh, because they lie about that too. 
like once you're in the firmware lying to you, um, then like, the what, sorry? They do lie less, you're right. Um, but it actually turns out it also performs worse uh, for our workload because um, we don't get to like write entire tape, uh, sorry, cache line side buffers down necessarily. Um, we did try, there is actually a flag that you can set to do direct IO. Um, it also turns out that not every operating system has direct IO, it's like a direct system. Sorry, no, Linux doesn't. Does Linux have it? It's either a, like, I forget, it's either Linux has it and very few other people do, or it's the other way around, and I can't remember which one. Uh, either way. Right, okay, that's it. That's it, because there's a giant thread post where Linux Torvalds tells everybody that they shouldn't be using it if they're using this stupid, like, a person that can make a bit of a dumb clock or something like that. <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's one of those classic posts that you should read for like, operating system. Um, so, you know, we're doing, you know, we're right, 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 F sync. And the problem is the F sync is going to return. We can't return to the client until we've S synced because we at least need to make a best effort to get the data onto disk, even if the disk itself is lying to us. Um, yeah, if we have one of these disks with a capacitor, we want to at least know that, like, the capacitor is a problem now rather than ours. So we have to F sync. F syncing on SSD is really quick, F syncing on a streaming drive is not necessarily so quick. Um, so what we, what we do is measure how long an F-sync takes. And then we adapt the thread that's doing the F-syncing to basically be constantly F-syncing. And it will gate the reply to a client based on the number of writes it can do during the F-sync. So what you'll see is spikes of like, you know, no replies, F-sync finishes, all the replies go back out to the client. Like, these are like millisecond gaps normally. But um, what we're effectively doing, rather than doing an F-sync for every request, what we end up with if we do that is the people at the head of the line get a really good response rate. The people further down the line end up like waiting for like seconds before their request gets serviced. Whereas what we can do now is amortize the cost of F sync constantly across all of the open requests. So at the rate at the um, expense of having like spiky workloads, by the time you've got everything else involved, it doesn't matter that much. Um, this is one of the things that Martin Thompson talks a lot about in his talks about mechanical syncopy, um, which I highly recommend. Yes. So as the thing changes over time, um, in particular as SSDs where the F sync time gets a lot different. Um, sorry? I don't know. If the OS would just like fix this for us, then it would save us a little bit. As it is, everybody has to do this work. I don't know. I, I, in fact, there are some operating systems that make a much better attempt at it than most others. Uh, like ZF, if you have a CFS in your operating system, we'll do a much better job of smoothing out that kind of stuff. Um, than most other things. So that's, uh, so Martin Thompson calls that thing smart batching. He normally refers to it for network performance, but yeah, it applies to everything that has an expensive resource that takes a set amount of time. Okay, so we were talking about monitoring. So what, what we want to know when we monitor event store is like, okay, we have a system which is responding at some rate. Right? Why is it, what's the bottleneck? So, you know, we have, if we look through some of the stages here, I, I think I can zoom, right? Yeah, there we go. These are some of the stages. So we have like a storage writer here is one thread because we want to linearize all the writes. We have um, a storage reader here. We have four of them because, you know, we can, we can have them blocked. Uh, this chaser thing is the thing that follows, so, the way we try and guarantee the data is on disk is we write it and then we try and read it again. And if we can't read it, then it means it's probably not in the right place yet. Um, so the things lied to us. Um, so we acknowledge replies by reading it back off disk. So the disk itself acts as a queue. Um, yeah, there's a whole bunch of these different things. So what we can see in, the, in this, uh, this monitoring screen. Um, so we might hit some of the caches, uh, but for reading we do turn on their right. For reading we do turn on their right now, um, if we can. Um, I can point you to like the to the right area of the code for this because there's actually some interesting stuff in there. Um, mostly because the CLR interrupt interrupts like regular system flow, so we end up doing like a bunch of key and punch stuff to get it to do the right thing. So is that part like pretty off cutting? Off cutting it's nothing to do with event storage. It's just making. Nope. I mean, that seems like that part could be. Yep, you could pull that out. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff like that. There's like 
is kind of useful. The reason we have it split out is because like I don't want to deal with like a thousand people using a library and force of bugs with the time for bugs. Um, like anybody that wants to use it can go and copy and paste it into that project. Um, so the way we monitor this is we have two things here. We have the current depth of each queue and the peak depth of each queue. And then you know some there are histograms of like every message process through the system, so we can start to tell uh, latency distributions for every stage. But in general, like you, you're going to have one of three things is going to be slow, right? It's going to be the CPU is overloaded, the disk is, is overloaded, or the um, network is overloaded. Did I say network? CPU, disk, network. And in general, the one that's overloaded is going to have the longest queue. Um, so you can go and start like making inferences about like what is and isn't happening. First, you can at least have a first pass of what's work, not working properly by looking at the queue lengths, the time to process things, and then you can start digging into like the standard system performance tools or whatever you've got to start figuring out what's actually wrong if it's not obvious. Um, so one of the really common things I hear about stage adventure of computation, which I don't, like talk about it quite a lot of people. And um, like the, the, you know, this is a representative quote, is like, this is complicated, juniors on my team will never understand it. And without fail, without fail, a project manager or a senior dev says that while standing in front of one of these. <laughs> and if you go think through and think about what a staged event-driven architecture for software would look like, you know, okay, so let's say we have our stages, and then we have our requests, and then we have our worker pool is like the people doing it. They have things like whip limits to represent back pressure. Yeah. You can basically directly map this onto Kanban. It's actually not that hard of an architecture. It can be like it has some implementation intricacies, but it's, it's Thank not. You, James, we do that for managing actual projects. We basically use the events from the event storm and rotate them 90 degrees for to do doing down on it. And we actually manage our projects that way. That's cool. There you go. See, it's not that bad here. <laughs> so, um, so the next few slides goes through some like pointers into the code base um, for various aspects of it. So we've talked mostly about the SATA so far. So the important areas of that, I'm not going to go through and like recode because like it's really small and it takes a long. If you have particular things you want to know about, then like ask and I'll talk about that. Um, there's a whole bunch of stuff here. So message is our like represents a message going around the system. If you want to look at like message pooling, that kind of thing for object allocation, that's worth a look. Can you put the I can put them up, yeah. Awesome. Um, enveloping, like, so our routing system is not static. So I know when we looked at that request, it looked like the path was known ahead of time. But quite often, messages will need to change their next destination according to what the contents of the message is. So we have things like, okay, so let's say we're the TCP thread that has the connection open right now. Well, like that's that particular worker. Um, we need to be replying from the same thread. So we have to have a way of routing dynamically back to that thread. So the way we do that is with like various enveloping that has like addresses and that kind of thing. So the routing is actually more dynamic than it looks. Routing scripts. Yeah, basically routing scripts. Sorry, yeah, routing is probably the correct word. I've been in America for too long, so. <laughs> I also say ZFS, I noticed earlier, because yeah, probably do either, keep calling it ZFS. Yeah, I used to call it that. <laughs> um, so Qt Handler and multi Qt Handler, respectively, are the implementation of the stage processing pipeline. Uh, it also deals with things like statistics gathering, um, latency measurements, that kind of stuff, as well as doing the work. Um, one of the important things is like, how do you, what do you do if there is no work for you to do? Like some of these queues don't see much traffic, um, but we don't want them to spin weight. So there's like ten different implementations of the wake up. Um, pattern and which one you end up using depends on what operating system, CPU type, and um, runtime you're on. Like all the synchronization primitives are like wildly different ones, uh, depending on OS in particular. Okay, so storage. So we have pen transactions, this log file. Like we don't actually want an infinite file because file systems don't deal that well with like a 10 terabyte file. So actually, what we do is split it up into chunks. So you know, 256 megabytes of file in each case, and then like when we get to the end of 256 megabytes, we start a new file, number it consecutively, and we can figure out from that. Uh, there are three different types of messages that get written to this log file. There's prepares, so you can do transactions, I didn't show them, but you can like do atomic, like DTC style transactions if you really want. 
um, someone paid us to do that. Like, I think it's disabled by default. You have to like use one of those flags, which is like, this is super effective. Like um, but we have to support it. Uh, prepare commit system, system records, like state changes for things like election epochs. Um, I'll talk more about that shortly. Uh, for the most part, like these are what these things look like. They have, um, you know, these are just structs that get listed to the disk basically, and then projected back over the top of the data as they get read. It's not that complicated. Every, um, every record is prefixed by its length so that you know, like, okay, so I have like one byte or two bytes that tell me the length of the record then the actual data itself, and then the length again. The length again is really important because it means you can read the log forwards or you can read it backwards. So you can start from the beginning or from the end. Um, so it's effectively like double length. So as we write, we have a single checkpoint in the system. This is one of the 24 bytes of usable state that I mentioned in the abstract. Um, that keeps, it's actually 32 bytes now, but it changes that. <laughs> So a writer checkpoint keeps track of logically where in that giant transaction file we are. So every byte in that transaction file has a number. And the numbers you see when you see like positions and stuff store map directly onto like where in the in the logical transaction file it is. So yeah, if you're a byte like 256 megabytes plus 10 bytes, then you're in the second chunk, 10 bytes in. Um, that's actually the not the most egregious use of pointers that I've seen like this. Um, I recently learned, have you ever, like, when you take a flight, you know, you put in the, the, the record locator? Does anyone know what that is? It's the memory address of the fucking mainframe where your record is stored. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> Crazy, but, like, this stuff is stuck for so long, but that's what it is. Um, so we have a checkpoint that keeps track of, like, where have we written up to so far? Like, the rep beyond that is irrelevant. The files are all immutable. So it is possible to delete events. There's a delete events operation. Uh, it's not common to see it used, but it is there. Um, there are compliance reasons why you might have to delete events, especially in Europe. You have to like, be able to forget data and delete events. Um, if you really want to make it so that you can't uh, delete anything, then write it onto write once media and then like, you can't delete it anymore. Um, but one of the common use cases is, let's say, the statistic streams. So this, this is the only storage events it has. So like it, it keeps track of the statistics by writing them to a statistic stream, which is part of this log. But we don't want to keep the statistics forever because they're not that interesting beyond like a couple of days' time. So by default, there's, a, there's an age, like a time to live on the events, which means you know they expire themselves after like I think it's ten days by default, maybe seven or something like that. Do you have to like write that to a separate like file, or do you have to, like, no. We just write them into the base list. Yeah, so when we delete them, what we do is instead we do a scavenge. So uh, what we do is like load a chunk and then we go through and rewrite it back out as a new file with the missing stuff taken away. And then a space map which maps like the original positions onto the new positions. Um, sometimes that actually results in it taking up more space, in which case we discard the new copy and don't bother scavenging it for a while, like until more has been deleted. But sometimes, like if you have particularly heavy like TTL stuff, if you're using it for commands and stuff, then you can end up merging lots of chunks down into one instead, and then like mapping them that way. Um, yeah, so you know, you can imagine we like the, the files are named like this. So this is like the number, the sequence number, and then this second number is the logical version of that chunk. So we could go through and say, like, we're going to scavenge this chunk. We're going to go through, remove all the data that isn't there. Let's say it's smaller in this case. In that case, we're going to write out a new file, which is 0 0.1. And then any version which is higher here is substitute. Sorry, any version which is lower is substitutable for a, for a more modern version. It will always have at least the same amount of data in that chunk. So you don't have to, like, transaction and swap these out. They can both be present, and there's no, like, ill effect because we know they're the same. Uh, so the important code in this, there's a class called TF chunk DB, which is like the logical entry point to all this stuff. Um, the log record is like physically what gets written to disk. Um, it's just like listed out, listed back. Not quite that, but it went up quite as bad as Postgres, where they literally C structures dumped to disk. And if you switch from a big end into a little end in the system, then your database format is different. I discovered moving from Spark to x86 on time. Um, like they don't tell you that. Not to, um, so chunk represents the actual like chunk files that 
that has all the scavenging operations on them, that has the commit operations, it has the read service, um, a reader and writes and represent like the actual service to your request. That's worth it. So that's interesting if you're interested in how it physically gets onto the So then the index. There's one index. Um, this is now out of date. They are, it's out, been out of date three times now. So um, we changed the index format over time as it became like, we came up with different use cases for it. They're actually, they are, Yeah, they're, they're 32 by entry. So every index entry, every event you write has a 32 by index entry that consists of a hash of the stream name. So that was, you know, originally we had one hash, we decided to see collisions and that screwed everybody up. So now we have a second hash and they have to both match for it to be considered a match. Turns out it's actually not that expensive to do. Uh, the expensive part is rewriting all the old indexes. So like it was support both formats and current. So you hash it two different algorithms. Two different ways, yeah. Uh, XX and MOMA3. Um, there's like .NET, IL implemented versions of both of those in the code base that you just like make reuse whatever. Um, that's actually the most common code to see reused because people use it for all kinds of like distributed stuff. Um, so after that, they have the event number within the stream. So yeah, yeah, like zero, 01 onwards, the actual sequence number. And then you have the position in the transaction log that represents the start of that event. Actually, the length of that, like the, the first length of that event. So the index starts off in memory. Um, this is actually very similar to how Cassandra works with uh, SS tables. <coughs> so let's imagine this is our transaction file. Um, and we, we're writing events into here. What we do is write the index into memory. We can rebuild the index at any point by just reading the log file and like recreating the index. So the index is actually not critical. It's a performance optimization file. We could rebuild it on every boot, but like, that's really expensive. Um, so we write up to a million of them in memory, and then the index forms a log structured merge tree. So we get to a million and we dump it to disk in a thing called a p-table, a persistent table. And we also checkpoint where like the, uh, like how far up it's indexed through the transaction file. And there's a constraint that the check, the uh, indexed, um, the index checkpoint must be less than or equal to the right of checkpoint. So you're not indexing ahead of where you've written. So as the number of p-tables grows, like let's say we have a million, uh, on disk, we have a million in memory. So we write that down, we write that down. When we get to the fourth one, so there's a cost to this, which is when you do an index lookup, you have to, to look through each one of these to find like the two hashes and the, you, know, you look up by the, the hashes and the, and the event number, or potentially the event number, depending on what kind of operation you do. But you, you don't know where these things are gonna appear. So what we'd really like to do is like merge the tables together. So we only have one thing to go look at and we can like binary search it. Because these are sorted. So what we have here is four sorted files, um, three sorted files on disk. Each of which could have, you know, our streams entries in it and they're sorted by the stream. So what we have to do is binary search through it looking for the, um, looking for the stream hash that we want. You can cache the midpoints of this, but ultimately, like we've still got three different things we have to search through, and we could just have one much bigger. So when we hit the fourth one, we merge the four together, get rid of these three, and replace it with one four million table, uh, four million entry table, and then, you know, we write another million, another million, another million, merge them. We now get two four million entries. So we've now got two to search through, but they're much bigger than they were previously. Um, these are both binary trees. These are plus trees. They're not B plus trees. They are, uh, so the, the structure on disk of this is just like one entry, like entries in, in order. There's no tree structure on disk. Okay. What we do is when we read the index file, we uh, cache the midpoints of where the binary search would take you down to like some level where it will get you to no more, to guarantee based on the size of the index to be no more than one disk hit per stream hash. We did try like all kinds of crazy after data structures for this, and it turned out none of them were as fast as just like caching the midpoints of the search tree. Simply found some kind of way. Um, so yeah, we just keep doing that. Eventually we end up with like a 16 million one. Um, it's kind of interesting, but um, the important code around this, I'll put these up. Network protocols, uh, I'm not gonna talk about because they take too long. TCP and HTTP. Our HTTP implementation is really bad, like it's not. That's how it works. TCP one is good. 
TCP one job, basically lift it out of training system that you would work on somewhat. Um, it's quite high performance. Uh, one of the guys on the team at one point like came in one morning and was like over a weekend, holiday weekend, and he's like, so I optimized all the TCP during that one. Okay. Uh, he's like, it's now like five times faster. We're like, yeah, that's bullshit. Uh, turns out he'd optimized it on localhost uh, without ever hitting a NIC. Uh, that code was already quite optimized beforehand, like hitting line rate on like 40 bit cards, basically. So it's, it's pretty well done. Uh, the HTTP, though, not well done at all. Like, not a good example. Uh, no, we talk about that. HA clustering. This is more interesting. So quite often when you want like a database, you want more than one of them because if power goes out on the first node, you want like the database to carry on working. The traditional way of doing this is a master-slave failover, like primary and secondary takeover, whatever you want to call it. Um, that doesn't work, basically. Um, the problem is when the primary comes back up, you can end up with a split brain. If you have a network split, then like both of them can think the other one has gone away. So they'll both keep operating independently. And okay, so now you have like two versions of history depending on which site you're talking about. Like, that's actually a bit easier to reconcile with event source systems than it is with anything else, because at least you have like discrete units of work you can go back and apply, but like still not very useful. Um, so any system which ends up like needing to solve this problem ends up with a quorum system. So you have an odd number of nodes, so three, five, seven, whatever. And the constraint is the majority of nodes have to be available and connected each other to each other for you to accept writes. Um, if there isn't a majority available, then they become read only. Uh, some systems that's a problem, like mutable systems, that's a problem. Immutable systems, that's a lot less of a problem because the data isn't going to change on the NICU. So a read only version is correct for all the data it knows about. It might not know about all the data yet, but it's not going to give you wrong values back for a particular um, object. It's not eventually consistent, it's eventually complete. Um, the, client would be eventually. the client is probably eventually complete. Um, so you could also do a quorum read, so you could go and talk to all the servers, and then you know you're correct. And we actually do that internally if you specify a certain option. So we'll go and like distribute the read for you, and if all the nodes are available, then we'll return. Or if the majority are available, we'll return. Similar to Cassandra. Um, the so the model we use, so there's a model actually that almost perfectly fits what we're doing here called Ruft. Um, Ruft was written in, I believe, 2000. I think it was published by Diego on Garo. I can't pronounce his name. Um, the guy at Stanford. Uh, I think it was published either late 2013 or early 2014. And it basically looks for a consensus system, which is simple to explain to people. Uh, the previous consensus system was called Paxos. Um, well, the previously common one is called Paxos. Notoriously difficult to understand. Uh, sadly, we implemented this in like 2011, well before his paper was published. Uh, so we implemented the complex one. And it turns out, if you take Paxos and put a distributed transaction log behind it, you basically get rough with more complexity. So like it turns out we basically are doing rough without really knowing that's what we're doing and with a more complex system implementation. Whatever. It works though. Um, so, like the way we tested this when we were building, this is kind of cool. These, um, these are, so these are, actually someone was asking us about the appliance version of it earlier. These are, these are some of the appliances. Um, so there's some various clusters here. So the first, basically the first commits that went into Event Store were testing commits. And uh, there were two things we were interested in testing. The first is uh, consensus. You can prove Paxos is correct, but there are like, I don't know how many branches there are on the possible tree, but it's a lot of them. Uh, a more, much more interesting way to test it is to induce failure and make sure that the results are as you expect they are. Do it billions of times, and then like, you'll be mostly sure it's correct, like if you're right or not. Um, so that's what we did. The second thing we're interested in testing in was uh, if testing was, is your data actually on disk and recoverable? Um, so these clusters were doing some. So one of them was doing like partition testing uh, via this crappy network switch. And the other one was doing power pulling testing. So we were writing in a cluster. And these things here, uh, IP control power distribution units. Um, so there are two, two different types of IP power distribution unit, it turns out. There's the APC ones, which are what you should buy. And then there are these things. <laughs> the APC ones are like a grand each. These were 69 bucks off. <laughs> from some Chinese website, and they're worth every cent. Yeah. So, 
uh, these respond to HTTP GET requests to mutate the state of power on each port. Um, and they give the result back as infinitely cacheable. So if you have a client that behaves, it works the first time, and then it never works again. Um, if you know what it's doing, it's fine, but you know, it takes a while. They're a lot cheaper. Uh, so we end up with a bunch of those doing testing. Uh, so what we do is write, like, have a client writing a bunch of stuff to the cluster, then we kill a mode at random, you know, leave the power off for a second, bring it back up, and then when the node came back up, it will go, it will go load its transaction file before rejoining the cluster and verify that a checksum of all the data written so far matches what we would expect it to match. Uh, so this was trying to detect things like lost writes due to um, due to like disk. Um, either the controller's lying. In this case, these were I forget what kind of disk they were. But we can guarantee, basically, if you use a disk that has the capacitor back controller, then you're not going to lose data because you're lost. Uh, you might lose it because your OS is misconfigured, like the write caching or something turned off, but you won't. <coughs> OS level write caching turned off, it won't be because of the bad source code. Um, the other one was doing network splits, so it was pulling, um, it's hard to see here, but each of those was connected, maybe there was a different time to this, but each of the nodes in the other cluster was connected to a different switch so that we could power pull to induce network partitions and verify that the state via a second network interface verify that like the node had gone into the expected state. So if it couldn't talk to a majority, it was supposed to become a decomposed master if it was previously the master, or like it was supposed to not be a participating in the network cluster if it wasn't connected at that point. So all those testing things are done. Um, there's a bunch of code for that, which I'm not going to go into. Uh, if you want to actually, so this, this is actually some of the more useful code if you want to build systems which self leader elect. So it's kind of common to use like the modern equivalent of doing this is like taking a console lock or like using bookkeeper or something. If you want, if you don't want to take a dependency and you want an election system in your own system, then you can like lift our election code. It's well tested. It works pretty well. You just have like a small interface for like what do you start doing when you become the leader? What do you start doing when you become a follower? What do you what do you do when like you become the post and change the state? Kind of it's like a pretty simple callback interface. You get that pretty quickly. Um. So, uh, also, I updated this. this is true. So, event store is at eventstore.org. We've been trying to buy eventstore.com for years, and like some asshole <laughs> is squatting on it. <laughs> um, that's why it was get eventstore.com for so long. We finally like managed to get hold of eventstore.org. Uh, like, the problem is the price keeps going up. Yeah. So, it's like, yeah, we're not, we weren't going to pay you like five years ago. We're definitely not going to pay you now. So, whatever. Uh, <laughs> The actual code is on uh, is in is on GitHub event store slash event store. Um, it's on Twitter and so uh, the docs are all on the website. Um, so if you like this talk, then I'm JN20 on Twitter. If you do not like this talk, then I'm AD Mitchell. Complain now. I noticed you had time with you, Virgil. Yes, that, that was the one edit I made. So I didn't bother with the date or anything. <laughs> <laughs> so with that, uh, thanks for listening. I, uh, we went like quite over time. Um, the tradition, certainly in the UK and parts of the US, is that there weren't beers after these things. So like, I'm probably going to find a bar nearby. Um, bearing in mind that I have a flight to see tonight, so and there are two ways this is going to end. Are you like, flying the plane, or are you just? No, I'm not flying. Right. <laughs> right. Uh, but I do have to go through immigration. So it's like three over. hours. Right. Um, so there are two ways this is going to end. Or I need to go to bed at like eleven, or I'm just going to stay up. <laughs> a word of warning, James and I both survived uh, working with Greg. Right, yeah. Greg. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah, if you want to take a couple of questions. Yeah, if yeah, 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 there are questions, then feel free. If not, then uh, like, we can just answer. Go ahead. So you got an appliance and a lot of work done on making sure things are going to disk. I've, do people deploy event store into hosted environments like AWS or Google Cloud? Yeah, most of them actually, it turns out, are AWS and Google. Um, Azure is a big one. Um, Google Cloud is another big one. Because you're not writing. I mean, do you have like how how would you do that? Because like, it's there's lots of ways to do that. Is there a do you guys provide a, uh, in terms of well, do you, what kind of containers should you be packing? What kind of storage? Oh, okay, yeah. So to? for the common clouds, um, like part of the, like so we sell support for this thing, and part of the commercial support is like a bunch of like CloudFormation, Terraform, whatever to to provision clusters and configure clusters. Um, it's not that hard. Like all the, it's you know, 
choose nodes appropriate for the choose instance sizes appropriate for the group that you need. Um, turn off right cache and that kind of stuff. It's like all the standard stuff you do for those kinds of things. But we see people running it. Like the biggest installations I've seen are actually in clouds, not not on hardware. Uh, for garbage collection, yes. so yeah. does that mean the state of the system is potentially changing? Uh, garbage collection of the transaction log, or of. Uh, so you mentioned garbage collection. So can yeah. you clean uh, the system that is running yeah. this file? So we don't ever we don't ever mutate the file on disk. We write a new file. Yes, but the interpretation of the state of the system is not good. Uh, yes, if you've done something that would change the interpretation, then it will be different. Well, if you're missing things, contribute to, would have contributed to Yeah, so it's a user's problem. If they go delete events which have semantic importance for them, then like that's their problem. We only ever delete things which are like system level stuff. So we go through and like we delete the statistics because like you probably don't need that. You can actually turn it off so it won't delete anything. Um, but we delete like statistics. Uh, it's quite common to see like if people are using uh, storing snapshots of their objects in a separate stream. One of the, the operations you can have is say like the maximum number of events you want on the stream, so you can window them. So you can say like, I only want to keep the last two of these. Yeah. So yes, you can. Like there is a delete operation if you go looking for it. It's like it's not like it's not commonly used. Um, but there are situations where it's not legally required to go to the data, and then, yeah, at that point, you can change your interpretation. So, like, choose your accurate or care carefully so that you can't do that if you don't want to. You've got, like, snapshot exactly. Do you, like, compress stuff <laughs> on disk, or do you just store it? Kind of I have, so I've yet to see a system where snapshots are actually matter. Um, like, normally there's some kind of, like, you don't get aggregates with, like, 100 million events. Or if you do, then you probably don't have, like, well, you should change the model. <laughs> <laughs> like, um, like, the obvious one is, like, the order book for, like, for a particular stock symbol or something. And that's, like, the canonical example of, like, all, all this history and then, like, all the future stuff. It's like, well, actually, like, make the aggregate, like, one day's work. Yeah, roll up. You know, at the end of the day, figure out what the journal entry is to start the next one. Like you can do that. It, you know, do that in almost every case where you have like really large number of events. Um, if you're still going to have cases where you need to like don't want to run through tons of events, so then you just like don't have to run many aggregates. And you're gonna right. Yeah. Want to catch <coughs> now, if you want to, if the problem is you want to replay all of them to go do something with them rather than just to get back to the current state, then yeah, you don't have that problem anyway. Um, in which case, um, snapshotting probably doesn't help you there though because. It's per calculation specifically. Right. right. If, it, if, it, if you need every event to go calculate something, then yeah, there's no way around it. You have to do that. Um, and then snapshots is helpful. Uh, it might be better not to store it back into the same database, though, because then, yeah. like, you end up, if you think about it, it's actually a pathological case of spin and rust where, like, you're reading from the start of, like, from somewhere in the platter and then writing, like, somewhere outside and then, like, flipping between the two. It turns out to take a It's it's one of those things where like you get if you get end up with like massive right amplification because of that kind of thing then like kind of inherent problem. I don't really have a solution. How do you scale it at the enterprise level? Uh you shot. And where is the system? It does that. <laughs> well, I'll tell you how to do that. We haven't implemented it because it's like so many different patterns for it. Um, do you have some like if, if you have if you have a need to do that today, could you do it with the, with the um, not without writing some code? Um, the way to do it is to um, is so you have like let's say you have let's say you want five shards because you want them. That's you've decided that's your performance characteristic. Um, the way you do it is in, in the client that's writing have uh, build in a consistent hash rate. With uh, so don't make the mistake of putting five nodes on a consistent hash ring, put like some large power of two and then map them to a specific shard, and then you can rebalance it later. Um, the problem is, like, we've looked for lots of generic ways of doing this, and it turns out like 
every generic way of doing this has like serious problems. Um, will only work for like some people. So we haven't like built a generic way of doing it. And it turns out the number of people who actually need that is quite small. A lot of people start off with the idea they might need it and then actually don't need it. If you actually do need it, then it's pretty cool. <laughs> what about the reads that are distributed? Uh, reads can be distributed across, um, yeah, reads can be distributed. So you can talk to any node in uh, HA cluster. Uh, you can, uh, depending on which flags you set on the group, there are, there are flags that you can set that control behavior of that. I think the default is um, follower nodes will forward read to the primary. But there's a way you can switch that off and then service reads from the followers too. And at that point, what you can do is just something, either like tether the connections to a specific, the reading connections to a specific node or like round robin load balancing or something like that. So we're generating a lot of system distribution for instance, The biggest, so there are two reasons to shard, right? There's either data capacity um, or there's throughput. Uh, generally, you want to shard for throughput and not data capacity because it turns out you can fit a hell of a lot of drives in a single box. Like, you stick a JBOT on the back of it, you can fit, like, you can build, like, 200 petabyte nodes pretty easily. Like, I've never seen the reason to do that just for, uh, just for data volume. For writing, for write scaling, I, it's... I've seen boxes get up to like 100,000 a second, events per second as well. Um, they're doing some like pretty serious optimization. Like to generate that much data is kind of hard work. So, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> like, so what's, what's like the search performance? Like, when you've got like this, it's years and years old and billions and billions of events, like, it's a bit, I know this is a naive, naive thought of mine, but when you were saying how like, you know, journaling, writing journals this is very, very good for writing, it's mm -hmm. very quick. But not necessarily good for reading because you don't have to do the search. Mm -hmm. It kind of seems very analogous to CRX in the sense you've got a write model, a write model that you want to journal, but then yeah. later on you want to write it into a binary tree. Or something. So here's one thing you could do to scale reads. Yeah. If you write using TCP and you reuse an HTTP, and one of the things that I did, maybe I'm not sure. Like, hold on. Uh, this is important. Uh, have a um, Okay, this is something that I want to do. So when we did the get individual event, this is an important thing. These events are immutable. So you can cast them infinitely. So you can have like a fleet of Nginx servers sat in front of this, proxying all the reads, and they'll just hit straight from open cache. So you can scale reads basically as much long as far as you like. Like you can scale out as much as you like just using HTTP. You can get like way better performance rates. Yeah, I guess my thought was like, you want to write all the all the events are getting written. You want to write the journals really, really quick. But yeah. at some point, you don't want to like go back for like five days or something and start writing those in like a feature format or something like that. You know, yeah, you might want to do that um, just because then right. you can search it because you're not going to be monitoring. Right. So this is one of the key things. Right, is you can't search. Wait, that's just not an operation we support. Um, the only operation we support. So the only operation we support is get by is either read everything in a stream. Or read a specific number in a stream, or read everything. Read everything is easy. You just start the, just start the transaction file, or at some point in it, read everything forward, um, which can be somewhat pathological to file caches. Um, if you read a specific thing, it's in order one lookup to know where on disk it is. Uh, if you've got that much data, you're probably on multiple spindles at that point, probably with a file system that has some kind of rain underneath it. So if you want to get fast, you're probably on like either mirrored VDEVs or um, like Rain Z2 or something. At that point, multiple possible disks could service the read. So actually, it's not that bad. And what is the more common use? Like, they have subscriptions or uh, like. Which are faster or which are. No, which is more used? Like, oh, um, cache probably. And then the read life. So the important thing to realize is that cache subscriptions are actually implemented in terms of live subscriptions. The only thing, so the way a cache subscription works, that's the one where we saw where we could say like where we want to start from. And have the event pushed to us. The way that works, the state is told on the client of where you are, and it actually issues read requests. And then, so when you've got up to the read to like the first point you can read, it subscribes, and then it reads again up to the point to the first event that gets over the subscription. 
to like cover any of the race conditions. Yeah, and then it like atomically switches out where the events are coming from. Um, you could do that with regular subscriptions in your own code, but it turns out it's really tricky in that race window to get it correct, and you often get duplicates. We guarantee you won't get duplicates if you do the error presentation work, but it's not like that's all client code. And um, what is people use catch up one a lot more. Which is why we ended up building it in. Like originally, we didn't have it. That came in like only a couple of years ago. It wasn't like really profit. After we saw like the 50 broken versions of broken ones. <laughs> <laughs> it's just like, okay, fine. Yeah, I fix it. Cool. Well, thanks for listening. So, a couple of things. Uh, we usually give away. Uh, uh, JetBrains license, uh, and we're going to do it really quickly today. So we're going to ask a question, or James can ask a question. And we're going to the right answer. Right, what, we're going to get it. Question, right? <laughs> Any question? Based, based on some of you presented. So I mean, I can a sample one. First, this is the first one. What type of uh, license yeah. does uh, the event store have? Anyone? There's that three clause. Okay. Okay. <laughs> 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 <Like he needs laughs> <one>. okay. <laughs> What's the next question? I'm asking some. Uh, okay. Um, uh, how long are index entries in bytes? Okay. There we go. <laughs> okay. Come see me after. Get a license. <laughs> and now uh, for the space where we're going. Yeah. Um, so we're going to go to the keg, which is just down the road here, for anybody that wants to go. Uh, very quickly, thank you so much to uh, to Matt and the Elastic Path team for making the space available. Um, Matt is actually going to be speaking at uh, not our next meetup, so our next meetup is uh, November 23rd. After that, uh, December 7th, Matt's speaking on CPRS and REST, uh, and the challenges of merging the two. <laughs> so that'll be an interesting talk. Uh, it's going to be back at Plenty of Fish, uh, so we're back at Plenty of Fish on the 23rd on the 7th. Thank you so much for coming, um, and we'll see you on the 23rd.